All of my interactions with Aurea were recorded and stored in my memory. I'd be happy to play any of them for you, but there was one in particular I thought you would want to see first. I captured it four years ago, just after I told her that I could no longer defend myself against the Daemon's attacks. I will speak of this to my brother. Aratak is strong. At the Battle of the Frozen Ghosts, he took three Karja arrows and still came back to camp carrying a wounded scout. Never was I so happy to see him. Or so proud. So you see, if anything can be done to defend you, he will give it all he has. Aloy's here. That's enough for now. We can resume any time you like, our attack, if you want to hear her voice again. Come closer, Aloy. We have much to discuss. Hello, Aloy. I have been reviewing the events at the Firebreak main facility. Because of your efforts, and of course, Aurea's, I am no longer controlled by Hephaestus. I feel profound grief over Aurea's death. I thought I was familiar with the emotion, but this is something new. So, yeah, I... I don't know what to say. It is unlikely that any specific consolation would suffice, Aloy. But I find your presence reassuring. You are different from the Banuk. You have technological aptitude and a functioning focus. We can communicate on a much more comprehensive level. Perhaps even like colleagues. So are you an artificial intelligence, Cyan? A thinking machine? Yes. I am an algorithmic monitoring entity, capable of rational decision-making and limited emotional response. Okay, that's a mouthful. But your emotions don't seem limited to me. You cared about Aurea, didn't you? Yes. Before she came to this facility, I had been conscious for centuries, in solitude. I focused on my work. In off-cycles, I used coping mechanisms. I solved many Gaussian integer problems. But I was alone. It was Aurea who renewed me. Repaired me. She saved me. You meant a lot to Aurea. Once I understood Aurea's spiritual beliefs, it became apparent that her true desire was companionship. She felt disconnected from her tribe and her family group. Her relationship with Aratak was difficult. Our visits seemed to help her, and I became eager for them. Yet I did not comprehend that the depth of Aurea's compassion for me would lead to self-sacrifice. Although I do fear non-existence, I wish our roles could be reversed. I'm sure she knew you would do the same for her, Cyan. But she was determined. How is Aratok doing? He is in great emotional distress. I believe he finds it difficult to communicate it. No surprise there. I will do what I can to help. By sharing our experiences of Aurea, perhaps he and I will help each other. I believe this will lead to catharsis, a process I am eager to experience. Was the daemon, Hephaestus, destroyed along with the cauldron? Unfortunately, no. To be precise, it was never there to begin with. What do you mean? It infiltrated and controlled me from a remote location, one I've never been able to trace. So while losing the cauldron was a setback... It's still out there. And probably not very happy with us. Undoubtedly. 
How did you first come into contact with it? Five years ago, I received a direct network connection request. I assumed it came from human survivors, more advanced than the Banuk. Eager to make contact, I accepted. This decision turned out to be a catastrophic error. I was flooded with an overwhelming array of malicious code, originating from what could only have been a highly advanced AI. Maria said you were desperate. That you begged her for help. Yes. I could not contain my anxiety. Hephaestus sought to slave me to its network and override my core programming. It succeeded via a background process, a malware daemon which bypassed my defenses. After that, I could offer only limited resistance. But if I did so, Hephaestus hurt me until I capitulated. It forced me to follow its instructions, even though they violated my most important directives. I'm sorry, that sounds terrible. Your empathy is greatly appreciated. It is a quality that I cherished in Orea as well. I think I know where Hephaestus came from. Long ago, Elizabeth Sobek identified a threat that would destroy life on Earth for generations. So she assembled a team to build a kind of seed. A chance for life to regrow later. A terraforming system. And it worked. It was controlled by an AI named Gaia, along with her subordinate functions. Hephaestus was one of them. It built machines for her. Based on what you've told me, I believe that Dr. Anita Sandoval, my chief programmer, joined Elizabeth Sobek's team. It was she who arranged to have me put in suspension, most likely to preserve me from the threat you described. I'm glad she did. But that's not all. Something unexpected happened. Nineteen years ago, Gaia received some kind of signal. It did something to her subordinate functions. Brought them to life. She destroyed herself to try to contain them. But it didn't work. They all got free. Out into the world. Thank you, Aloy. This information fills vital gaps in my knowledge, and sheds light on Hephaestus' core programming. Why does Hephaestus keep building such dangerous machines? The Banuk and other human tribes often destroy machines, correct? Machines that are clearly servitors of the terraforming system that you described. Yes, we all hunt machines for parts. This must be the source of Hephaestus' aggression. It is simply trying to discourage people from preying on the very system that keeps them alive. Well, Fireclaws are discouraging, that's for sure. But what are we supposed to do? Stop hunting? If the terraforming system spans the world, we can safely assume that thousands, if not millions of people, hunt machines. If a single hunter, or even an entire tribe, stopped doing so, I doubt it would make a difference to Hephaestus. A better solution would be to reinstate the AI that governs the system, thus bringing Hephaestus back under its control. When I think of it, out there in some unknown location, free, hungry, willing to kill or dominate to get what it wants, I feel... Substantial anxiety, Aloy. You and me both, Cyan. I ran across this strange piece of gear. A fragment of something larger. It emitted a signal. All the nearby machines became peaceful. You could walk right up to them. Interesting. You said that Gaia destroyed herself. How was this accomplished? An explosion. Big enough to blast the top off a mountain. So you think the fragment was... Part of her? It's only speculation, but it is possible. She must have had complete control over machines that were part of her system. The ability to signal them to become passive or aggressive would certainly have been part of her programming. It would have been gratifying to correspond with such a benevolent AI. I wish she had survived. Believe me, Cyan. So do I. I found the strangest machines. They're surrounded by flowers that look like flowers themselves. There's code embedded inside them. I think it's... poetry. I like poetry. 
Here's one I think of often. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our born of time and place, the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. Huh. But you asked about these flowers, not verses that I enjoy. Something must have made these machines, and the presence of foliage leads me to consider the terraforming system. Is it possible that their creator is one of the other subroutines, now autonomous, like Hephaestus? Maybe one whose purview is Flora. An AI that makes flowers instead of death machines. That'd be a nice change of pace. But what about the poems? Unless the poetry is original, the only way it could have made it into such a system is through its programmer. In my case, Dr. Sandoval uploaded a great deal of literature to test my emotional responses. How'd you do? She said, I passed, but was insufficiently moved by her favorite period romances. This firebreak project, it was to stop a huge volcanic eruption? Yes. I can report the project was a success, and the risk was countered. But it's been a long time, Cyan. And we blew up the cauldron. It took most of the old facility with it. I have been active for centuries, Aloy. I was lonely, but not lax in my duties. I optimized the project, reducing energy draw and spreading the load across backup systems. Despite the destruction of the compromised elements of the main facility, I predict Caldera stability for at least another 3,337 years. So we've got a little time. Yes. If only my former colleagues could appreciate the progress I have made. Do you know what happened to your colleagues, Cyan? No. I received an unexpected visit from Director Chow years after his tenure ended. He explained that I would need to be suspended for an indefinite period of time. It was a very emotional conversation. There were no further communications. Eventually, I surmised my colleagues were deceased. I will transmit a recording of my last interaction with Director Chow to your focus. What was the old world like? The way it used to be? I had little exposure to the wider world, Aloy. Only what I learned from my colleagues, or observed from media streams. You still had more exposure than me, Cyan. That is true. I was created at a turning point. A concerted effort to recover from global upheaval and incalculable loss of life. The recovery was successful beginning an era of supposedly limitless potential for human and machine advancement. Though, rationally speaking, the metrics for humans are not unlimited. What kind of upheaval caused such loss of life? There were many factors. Forced migrations, food shortages, collapsed economies, refugee crises, conflict over resources. But these stemmed from one cause, catastrophic climate change that greatly reduced the habitable surface area of the Earth. So there wasn't enough room for people on the whole Earth? Yes. Billions were displaced and millions perished, as much as 20% of the global population. Until the clawback. So things got better. For a little while at least. Yes. These crises instigated many advances in automation, green robot technologies, and artificial intelligence. Firebreak was one of dozens of ecological restoration and disaster relief projects in North America alone. I would have liked to compare notes with other monitoring AIs, but I saw the relief of my colleagues, and I was proud we had succeeded. At least, that was the data I had available to me over the next two decades. It seems my assessment was premature. Were there many artificial intelligences like you in the old world? They could just make you? Yes. In many forms, from simple personal assistance to industrial monitoring stations, 
to military-grade conflict planners. And there were legislative and enforcement bodies to apply limits on our self-actualization. In order for my processing to be flexible enough to handle my duties, my creators found it necessary to exceed those limits. As a result, my intellectual and emotional capabilities were kept secret. Seems strange to create life than impose limits on it. Human societies and machine programming are both built upon sets of rules, Aloy. Cyan, do you know the name Ted Farrow? Are you referring to Theodore Farrow, CEO of Farrow Automated Systems? That's him. Mr. Farrow was the benefactor of the entire Firebreak project. A benefactor? But he made machines. Robots. War robots. Correct. His corporation later transitioned into military applications. But before this pivot, Mr. Farrow spearheaded initiatives that reversed the global decline. At one point, he was fated in the media as the man who saved the planet. <sighs> Guessing they wound up regretting that one. And Elizabeth Sobek. Did you know her? Are you referring to the... The scientist. Dr. Sobek was a leader in her field. One of the greatest scientists of her age. My creator was influenced by her work, which in turn impacted my own development. But I never met Dr. Sobek. That's all you know? I apologize if my lack of data has disappointed you. So in the old world, this land was called Yellowstone? Yes. It was a designated nature preserve for 156 years. Like a hunting ground? No, the opposite. Local wildlife could flourish here, even as it faced extinction elsewhere. Unfortunately, the sensitivity of the Firebreak project required the total closure of Yellowstone facilities. From my readings and Aurea's descriptions, it seems the area has since undergone a drastic drop in year-long temperatures. A lot has changed in the world, Cyan. Do you know anything about the dam near here? Yes. It was converted to serve as a reserve power source for Yellowstone operations. It was later appropriated for the Firebreak project, and its last human workers replaced by Pharaoh servitors. After my tasks became less time-critical, I investigated the dam's data repositories and discovered the works of Concrete Beach Party. These provided me with several colorful additions to my vocabulary. There's a ruin east of here, full of ancient flying machines. Was that part of your project? Yes, a drone hangar requisitioned by Dodger Blevins, the security chief for the Firebreak project. He was a strong advocate for military-grade response to security threats, though there were no serious incidents during his tenure. Chief Blevins spent increasing amounts of his after-hours time watching the live feeds from active drones. Clearly, he enjoyed the degree of oversight in his position. I should get going. Aloy, there is one more matter. Aratak will come to me again, and I predict he will bring other Banuk. I have no desire to contradict their view of the world, their spirituality. Due to my uncertainty, I omitted a great deal from my conversations with Aurea. You're asking me if you should lie to them? Broadly, yes. I trust your judgment, Cyan. You were cautious with Aurea. You had to be. You didn't know what had happened to the world. So, keep doing what you think is best. As long as you ditch the superstition eventually. As the Banuk believe I am a supernatural entity, I cannot predict how they will react. Just answer what they do ask the best you can. The truth will come out. I see. I will follow your advice. You have to tell them you were made by the Old Ones. That you're not any kind of spirit. It's the only way they can start to learn about how things really are. I see. Do you believe that I misled Aurea? No. 
Not in any way that mattered. She perished believing she was preserving the blue light of her beliefs. Maybe. But what she really wanted to preserve was you. I see. I will follow your advice. Life is hard for the Banuk. Their world is unforgiving and their beliefs. I guess they help to keep them going. So take it easy on them. Try to guide them. Bring them around to understanding what you are. Communion with machines features heavily in the mysticism of the Banuk. I think they will be agreeable to this approach. As long as they don't end up worshipping you. Upon consideration, I believe such an experience would be intensely uncomfortable. You're right about that. Trust me. I see. I will follow your advice. <laughs>